Excellent. All right. Yeah. That's great. Um, I wish we had a bigger room. We may have to even move the fellowship hall one of these days. That's why they're like, we still got more room. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. Yeah, we, uh, we, we run out of big classrooms. Well, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with our prayer list. I just want to update a couple of things real quick. Um, one is Ken Morgan is at home. He's recovering. He's still hurting. I uh, kind of had a flare up last night. It took him a while uh, to get through. And uh, anyways, he's at home. So keep praying for him. Also, Terry Lyle, uh, she had uh, 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 like an epidural type thing yesterday. She's been through a lot of pain. So pray for her as well. She's had a lot of back problems. And we've had several that have been out sick that are back, which is great. Um, keep praying for Mike Reedy and also for Joel Frame, uh, Hesley, <laughs> Leslie and Helen, uh, Zoe, Patty. Uh, we mentioned last week Ruth Ann and uh, Natty, and they're doing better. And, um, of course, we mentioned last week Carrie, and she's feeling better. So that's great. Uh, House Diane, James. Let me give you a report. Okay. I told a few Sunday. We went to UAB last Friday. Uh, they wanted to do radiation. Mm -hmm. Diane didn't want to do radiation at this point. So what they decided to do is wait 90 days. Then they'll do new testing to see if there's any new growth or anything, and then go from there. Okay. okay. So keep playing, please, for the next 90 days. You got it. Um, I know Tommy and Joe were gone. And they went to go visit their uh, granddaughter. Baby was born while we were there. We missed that last week. That was on Facebook. Um, keep praying for the Porters and the Pittmans. They've been out uh, sick, and um, they should be back hopefully Sunday. Uh, also, keep praying for our youth minister search. We hadn't mentioned that in a while, but we want to keep praying that we get the right guy to come and lead our kids. Um, you know, we Elders mentioned several months ago, actually, that I think it was in October, that we were going to start having some tryouts pretty soon. And so it looks like we're probably going to start, uh, if not uh, on the 11th, I know there's somebody scheduled for the 25th. So 25th and March 3rd. There's two guys scheduled, and I think we may have one on the 11th as well, but it's just we've got to finalize it with the, with the elders. But that looks like we've got at least three that are going to come. So be praying. Um, pray for our parents, too, to ask all the right questions. And uh, our kids, uh, they're going to have a vote as well, I'm sure. So um, looking forward to meeting some of them. I know a couple of the guys that have uh, decided to come. And good, good young men love the Lord and, uh, and, and love kids. So we'll see. How that works, so keep praying for that. And of course, Becky, we've been praying for her, getting some good news, and so we're going to keep praying and praying and praying. Everything works out all right. Um, we mentioned last week also um, uh, Roger McCaleb, keep praying for him. He's doing a little bit better. Who else we need to mention this morning? Yeah, we need, good to have you and Owen here today. Thank yeah, it's awesome. It's good to be here. Like, coming yeah. Owen's brother is at the point of death. trying to stay updated on um, there's a, a little girl at Free Hardeman and I can't remember her name just yet. Her last name starts with an H. Carl, Harold, yeah. or something like that. Something like that. She, she actually <coughs> she's kind of a, an athlete she's really active and uh, she came back to her dorm room and laid down and when they came in to check on her she was dead. She had a blood clot and so they had they have no idea you know what happened as her mom's very sweet she put they got her journal that was set by her bed and she was journaling about seeds and planting seeds and watching how god makes the garden grow and i mean you, i just get chills when i read it i was like wow this little girl she's uh 
she was going to be 19 this week. So very sad. So they had a big uh, vigil uh, last night. They did one the night before, and just keep praying for that family. It's really tough. That's strange because they all, his last sermon, he said one of the greatest things he was looking forward to was to hear, well done, thy good and faithful sermon. That's right. That's awesome. That's something. Yeah. And so keep keep praying for those families. Who else we need to add? I'm going to be traveling tomorrow. All right. I'm going to be back Saturday or Sunday in it might be all right, Tiffany. They've been under the weather with the upper respiratory or yeah. you know, virus or whatever it's, whatever they name it when you go. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know uh, here a little while back, Orlando had a procedure of some type yeah. done. I, I, I yeah. haven't noticed it. Yeah, he came. He's been back one time since then. He, yeah, he got I got the uh, corona. Yeah, and he, he has coughed so bad that he has damaged his throat a little bit. Yeah. It's going to be a while for you know. Yeah, hopefully you know. He matter of fact, he just went. I think this past Friday, I think it was, back to see the doctor about his throat and everything. You know, so, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, remember them the porters too. They been, they came back from the cruise with COVID, so. <laughs> That was not fun. Mm -hmm. um, remember the Jobsons too? They just moved in. They're placing membership. Um, we've got another couple that says they're placing membership. I haven't gotten a phone from them yet. But anyway, we've had a lot of people coming in. This has been an awesome week. We uh, Brett was baptized Wednesday night. Uh, then Sunday, uh, we had Stevie. I studied with her Wednesday, but she decided to wait. She wanted to talk to her dad first. Um, so. She was baptized Sunday, and then Sunday night, we were hanging out here talking like we normally do, and here comes Marco, yeah. and he's like, we've got three that need to be, well, he said, we've got a couple ladies, yeah. and then he, I said, a couple ladies, he goes, no, a couple guys and one lady, I was like, okay, so then they get in, well, then one of the other ladies stepped forward, she goes, me too, so they had four baptisms on Sunday night, and then uh, we were riding that high, and then yesterday, um, Eric Gray called me from Robertsdale, and he said that he, he needed our baptistry, because we, um, uh, we, we had ours. I mean, it's obviously Micah's got it running and it's warm. And, uh, so we were like, oh, yeah, 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 come on. They are cleaning theirs, trying to repair it. And uh, so they came down, and then Michelle Fountain texted me. Her husband, Philip, is a principal up in Robertsdale, and I've known them for forever. Uh, his dad, Wayne, was an elder at Fairhope. And so, so Michelle texted me, and she's like, hey, thanks for letting us use your baptistry. And I was like, what are you talking about? And she said it was John Kerry. So, boy, I hustled over there. And uh, so her son, John Kerry, strangely enough, he was 12 when he was baptized. And he came forward the day I tried out at Gulf Shores. So I saw his baptism, you know, in 2007. And so then I came over there and uh, got to watch, you know, him and... So, uh, anyways, he was baptized yesterday, and so that's, our baptistry has been used seven times in less than a week, and I just don't know any other churches that can say that, so we were just super excited, you know, all glory to God, but um, we stuck around for about two hours and talked, and um, he's turning 30, I think, soon, and uh, he's just ready for a new change, and he talked about things he'd done in his past he wanted to be clear of, and didn't really know, he'd been so far removed from the church for all this time, he couldn't even remember why he did it, and so um, he decided to be baptized again. So we, boy, we've had a great, great week. And uh, so, I, like I said, stay around with him for a couple hours and talk. They're headed to Missouri today to look at a welding school. He's thinking about joining. So that's all good news all around. I think Brett was first when he says, it was cold. Yeah, it was cold. <laughs> Brett got in there. But last night when we did that one yesterday afternoon, and they were like, man, it was warm. <laughs> I said, well, don't linger in it, you know. So, yeah. Yeah, pray for our country still, and then what's going on there at the southern border. Yeah. Yeah, I hate to get political, but we, you know, the Supreme Court supports it, so cutting down all the five, five judges decided it was all right. Yeah, it's really good. What do you think, Joe? You got, you got another prayer request? No, I'm, I'm good. good. I'm good. I'm sorry. Right, the young lady's name with Brie Hardiman is Heron, H-E-R-R-E-N, and her first name is Destiny. Destiny. And who else we need to mention this morning? All right. If there's nothing else, Joe, would you want to make some sure? I'd be glad to. <clears throat> Holy Father in heaven, 
we just give you praise and thanks, God, for this beautiful day you created. And God, we're so thankful that this group of people, Father, can, can meet here this morning to, uh, to study your word, Father. And we're thankful for each one that's in our presence today. We thank you, Father, for their for their talents, their abilities, and Father, for all the things, Father, they do to help us here at Somerville to, to do the things that we need to do to serve you. God, we're also grateful for Ray, Father, and his great ability that he has. We thank you, God, for sending him to Somerdale for us. And, and Lord, we ask you to continue to guide him in his studies. And Father, let him always bring something to us, Lord, that will help us each day, Father, to strive to be better Christians. And we also ask you to be with his good wife, Misty. Father, we know she has some health issues. We just pray, God, you'll bless her, Father, and give her the health and strength she needs, Father, as she works with her husband, Father, as they work with us here. And God, we just went over a, a long list, Father, of people that, Father, that that need you, need you, need your healing, God. And we just ask you, oh Father, to please be with them. And Father, for the ones that have lost their lives, God, just this last few days, God, we just pray your mercy to be upon them in a special way. And Father, we pray at this time you will be of our country, God. We pray, Father, that. Our leadership will work, wake up, Father, and do the right things, Father, to help secure our country. And we pray, God, at this time that you will be with the uh, five military uh, people, Father, that have lost their lives in the last week or two, Father. We just ask you, O oh God, to be with their families and, and, Father, help them. And please, O oh God, heal their hearts. And we pray, God, that no more casualties, Father, will happen. Father, just pray you'll bless us here at Somerdale. Let us always, Father, look to you for guidance. Let us always serve you the best we can. And God, please forgive us for our many sins. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Right. Suggestion. Yes. Silence your phones. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, have, I, went off. I put mine on, uh, uh, on uh, airplane mode. <laughs> well, I know. Uh, we do this every uh, on the last Wednesday of every month, and it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, Misty is tied up at the house, but she'll meet us over there to eat. And uh, I convinced Christy to go with us, so we'll just take the staff and go, and we'll have a big time. So hopefully, you, you're able to join us. Uh, if you have your Bibles open up to uh, John chapter 12, we did not finish last week. I did not push it uh, because I knew that there was so much rich material here; it would be uh, probably be hard for us to cover it all in one week. And really, the, the events of chapter 12 and 13 are key uh, because this begins what we see as the, the, uh, what they call the Passion Week. This is the last week of Jesus' life. So last time we talked about uh, Lazarus, we talked about his resurrection and what that meant for the followers of Jesus. It put them under tremendous pressure. It was very clear that the Jews wanted both Jesus and Lazarus dead. And they're going to stop at nothing to kill both of them. We don't know Lazarus's fate. All we know is that uh, he seems to be afraid for his life, as many people were that were close to Jesus. And uh, Mary and Martha had been there by Jesus' side. Of course, he has his feet uh, anointed with oil. And Judas gets upset about it. We talked about that, him taking the money back and uh, trying to keep some for himself. And that becomes a major issue in a few chapters. But right now, John is writing retrospectively to say this is what he was doing at that time. And this, is, this shows you his motive a little bit. So we ended somewhere between uh, 9 and 36. And so I've got Mark there, 9 to 36. I don't know what that means. But anyways, just briefly, let me mention that um, the Greeks that were there began to take notice of what's going on when... Uh, Jesus makes his way in for the Passover. It is customary that you go to the, to the city of Jerusalem and go to the temple at least three times a year for feast days. Historians tell us that during Passover week, there was at least no less than a, a quarter of a million Jews visiting in a city that I don't know if you could find enough hotels and places to stay. So usually you stay with family with friends, and that seems to be what Jesus does when he goes and visits. He stays in Bethany and then makes the walk, uh, which is right around six miles. 
So in this, this scenario, now they're making their way to town. There's probably more than that. We would estimate almost half a million people because people were hearing about Jesus. And so much so, you know, if you ever watch uh, videos of dignitaries or presidents that make their way into town, you know, you have the big entourage. People stand out by the sides. Um, funny story. I would... When I was a kid, I used to do impressions. I, I don't do them as much anymore. I can do some voices. I do Mickey Mouse and a bunch of things. Kids love it. But anyway, I used to do a real good George Bush impersonation. And so uh, I was junior, I think, in high school or sophomore in high school. And I called the radio station uh, and pretended to be George Bush. It was kind of like, but uh, they knew it was, it was a parody. But uh, when, when he came to town, this is George Bush Sr., uh, H.W. Bush, and when he was going through uh, the town next to us, he stopped at the McDonald's. Of all the things to do, he stopped at that new McDonald's in Marshfield, and that was a big deal for our communities. You know, say, oh, the president stopped today at our McDonald's. I don't know that I've even eaten at McDonald's, but the president did. <laughs> so uh, there was all these people coming through town. Well, fast forward several years ago, uh, they, they started making stops along Missouri. It's kind of like, it's not really a battleground state, but it, it can once in a while swing. So, um, you know, Trump, Trump came to our little town, or at least to Springfield, near where we grew up. So my brother uh, had the, um, the honor of being able to be one of the local guys in that entourage. And the way they did it is they actually had three different convoys. You didn't know which convoy they were in. So um, I think he was on the one where the president wasn't, even though he got to meet some of the Secret Service, which to them was almost like meeting the president when you're meeting these guys that, that guard him every day. But usually when there's someone coming into town and you know about it, you'll line the streets. This is why I believe that this was the perfect time for Jesus' crucifixion. More people had heard about him after three and a half years of preaching that they were wanting to see him more and more frequently. So when they know the Passover's coming, and they know what Jesus has said about the Passover lamb, and they know what John the Baptizer used to say, this is the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So Jesus makes his way into town. They line the streets and lay down palm branches. Now the palm branches were somewhere between three to five, maybe six feet long, and uh, they, would, they would hold them out from the stem and, and fan. Uh, in fact, if you've ever seen old pictures or drawings of Egyptian pharaohs uh, and kings like Herod, I don't know necessarily that every Caesar did this, but they always had a group of people around them. Usually it was a harem of women and uh, occasionally some men to the doors. And so these people have taken, they had to literally break off palm branches off of trees. And they're lining the streets and they're laying down these branches at Jesus' feet. Which, if you're, if you're in the crowd, you want to know what's going on with this group of people lining the streets as Jesus comes in. So he was the most... Uh, I guess the most visible celebrity that Jerusalem had ever seen. And it was going to be greater than the Pharaoh or the, uh, the Caesar, because if Caesar's made his way to town, not all Jews liked him. In fact, most of them did not. So that's the scene as they come in uh, to the city. And so again, you think about between a quarter of a million, half a million visitors, not including city residents, that are going to be lying in the streets um, to meet him. So let's go back and let's read. Uh, I'm going to pick up at verse... Let's start at verse 12. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took brought branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, setting on a donkey's colt. These are all prophecies fulfilled. His disciples didn't understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things were written about him, and they had, uh, had done these things to him. Therefore, the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For the reason, for this reason, the people also met him, uh, had, because they had heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, You see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Only if the world had followed him. But that was their fear, is that he was taking over uh, their position of authority. But he's fulfilling promises and, of God, fulfilling prophecies of prophets. So we ask the question, you know, why palm branches? Why not, just, why not just tree branches? Why not 
clothing. You know, they oftentimes lay down their cloak for somebody to walk across or something like that. Why palm branches and everything else? Well, usually palm branches were used in the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, they use that as part of, the, part of the process. But on this particular day, it tells us that they were waiting for him. They had heard about Lazarus, or it says the witnesses of Lazarus are present, probably stirring up the crowd. There's a guy coming from Bethany. He's coming from that direction on this road at this time. And he's he's going to be walking, and he's probably going to have Lazarus with him. And we were there when he rose from the dead. So the crowd begins to circulate, uh, and they, they hear the story. They're like, we want to see this guy. Well, Moses had instructed him in Leviticus 23 and verse 40 to use these palm branches because it was a sign of the Messiah. In fact, we look at Revelation 7 and verse 9. It talks about palm branches being used in worship and praise in heaven. And they're crying Hosanna, which is part of the Hallel, singing of the Hallel. They had a, a, a group of songs where they would sing it in worship. So they're singing a worship hymn. They're laying down palm branches, and which... Then they see him making his way, not on a horse, not on a donkey, but a baby, baby, a little tiny colt. And so he's not coming in on chariots like they expected their Messiah to do. And this is meant, I'm telling you, there's a lot of things. This is a prophecy fulfilled, no doubt. I want to make that clear. But you can't tell me that people in the crowd didn't find this hilarious. As here comes the Messiah. And what's he riding on? A little baby animal. I mean, he's not, I don't know if you've ever, when you were little, maybe you tried to ride your dog. You know, you ever did that. we did that, grabbed a collar, and here we go. The baby would be just a little bigger or about the same size as a large dog. So Jesus is riding on this little bitty animal all the way into the city. And you can't tell me that people would have been, what is he on? The only reason he did it was to fulfill prophecy. But our image of Jesus, uh, we often think about him out teaching and with authority. This was meant to get attention. This was an attention grabber. He's riding this little baby animal, probably with his feet on the ground, like, you know, you're riding a tricycle, trying to, because this little tiny animal, and it was meant for people to go, what is he doing? Why is he riding? Well, if you ask why, most of the Jews knew he was supposed to come in on a young colt. And that was the prophecy. And they automatically get triggered because they're just like, oh my goodness, this guy is pretending to be the Messiah. The whole world's going to follow him. Uh, yeah, Ben? Uh, um, they learn that the ashes is what they use on Palm Wednesday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, they celebrate, um, and not just Catholic anymore, it's a lot of modern day religious groups. Methodists. Methodists sue a lot because yeah. I used to sell them to them. <laughs> right. Well, there was a video some time ago, one of our preachers and our fellows <coughs> went around interviewing, uh, sometimes not willing interviews, but interviewing guys on Ash Wednesday because there's these all these, you know, Methodist, Episcopalian, you know, Orthodox, all these people out here that got the dots of ash in their forehead. And, like, why would you do that? Are you loyal to the Pope? pope? Are you? <laughs> and Because uh, it is a Roman Catholic tradition. But I remember when I moved down here uh, some 17 years ago, I remember seeing people. I, we really didn't see it much in other places I've been. But when I moved here, you could go to, I went to Rouse's one day, and, like, half the people in there had the dot in the middle forehead. And I was like, whoa, I, I, I just didn't expect that. Um, but... But this was meant to be the start of this Passion Week. Uh, that they, they are meeting Jesus, and they're, there's Palm Sunday is the Sunday before uh, the crucifixion, so one full, or before the resurrection. It's one full week. But that midweek is the, the day that they, they put the ash in their foreheads. And it's just really, and they do the sign of the cross and all that stuff. But um, they're crying out, they're singing worship hymns, they're laying down palm branches. And it's a, it's a, it says, and I think it's the way this word in the Hebrew is a new cult. So literally, it is a baby animal, a baby. Uh, it's very hard to ride on a little tiny thing. Now, Jews were short. Uh, I don't have to tell you that in their culture, uh, it wasn't uncommon if you were a Jewish man to be between five and five three, maybe no more than five six tall. So he's uh, a little, you know, all of them. Zacchaeus was really little, but but the rest of them, most Jews were pretty short. 
And so he's, he's writing this thing in, and I just, to me, it's one of those visions I would love to have seen their faces. When the Pharisees saw him coming in, they go, well, he's done it now. He has done it now. He, of all the prophecies, can't believe he did this one. And they immediately decide they're going to going to kill him. But remember, there's a lot of new things. You know, Jesus is buried in a new tomb. Um, he brings on the new birth. He speaks of new wine and his prophecies. And then now the crowd is full of new people. There are Greeks in their midst. Listen to verse 20. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains there alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. So uh, these, these things, again, coming from prophecy, uh, one of the things is Zechariah 9.9. 9. Zechariah 9.9 9 gives this prophecy of, of Jesus coming in, in on this, this donkey, uh, this little cult, that is intended to show the people that something is going to grow. Something, you know, you have this little baby animal. Why are you riding a baby animal? Because this is planting the seed of something greater. And ultimately, the people that are present and the apostles from here to Acts 2 are going to be trying to figure out what's next. Yeah, Lewis? Riding a small coat like that also demonstrates his humility. Yeah. Compared to any other dignitaries that come into town, they put on a big show. And uh, it also follows the prophecies of Daniel for the coming of the kingdom. But I will say this, and I don't have my notes on this with me, I don't think. Um, there is a prophecy, in, and it's in Moses. I'm trying to think. Um, we've read through. In fact, I'm ahead now. I've, I'm in the middle of Leviticus and reading. But there is a verse, and I will find it, uh, that said, Moses says basically, you shouldn't have a king. But if you do have a king, he cannot collect women, and he cannot collect horses. It's exactly like that. So what happens with Saul? What happens with David? What happens with Jonathan? Uh, what with, with Jonathan? With Solomon. They collected women, and they collected horses. So the prof another prophecy is kind of, again, that you wouldn't know that unless you've read it, because I haven't heard a lot of commentators talk about it. But there is a statement made by Moses about not multiplying horses to yourself. So Jesus doesn't have horses. He's not coming in on chariots. He is showing, like Lewis says, showing his humility, coming in on this little animal. And it would have gotten a lot of attention. Um, would have been a shock. Uh, Philip is actually a Gentile name. Yeah, go ahead. That animal was also completely unbroken. So it yeah. So there's power over animals. That's right. He could ride it. It didn't look. It didn't do anything. That's like right. You would expect it. Right, and that would have been, I hadn't thought about that. That's a great point. That's a miracle in itself. You could ride this little critter. Because um, they weren't used to being ridden. No, they weren't used to being ridden. And donkeys didn't, and you know, he, you're not supposed to own a horse. You're not supposed to multiply horses. So he uses a borrowed animal, right? I mean, how would you feel if, if, if the guys came to you, the disciples, and said, hey, look, Jesus has use of your, I mean, literally, the mama gives birth, drops it out, they're still saying, hey, did you hear? we got a new young cult. As Jesus' disciples come up and go, yeah, we, we, we like to borrow that. Our master would like to ride it. I mean, you know, that, again, uh, a lot of underlying, very interesting still part storylines that we may miss, but this one is very interesting. Yeah. That, uh, we were at a party at a little animal farm, mm -hmm. and this woman showed us on the back of a donkey where it starts at the nose and it's a line that goes all the way down its back and then there's a cross member and it says it's because Jesus rode a donkey. That's right. That's right. And so that, that animal has that cross shape. It's really cool. Yeah, Ben? It also shows the faith that the apostle had in Christ doing exactly what he said. Yeah, exactly. You just follow the directions. They're going to do the same thing when they get to the upper room. They reserve the upper room. It says you just go and tell them that the master has need of it. 
And, uh, and people, a lot of people were interested in, in uh, hearing what Jesus had to say and seeing what his next move was. So everybody's willing to participate. I think, too, it's interesting that Jesus, uh, in earlier teaching, had said, don't go to the Greeks. Stay in the household of Israel. Stay with the Jews. Don't go into the whole world yet. But soon after his uh, resurrection, he begins talking about going into the whole world. So at this point, his interest was not converting the Greeks, but he certainly didn't push them away. And this shows that the rest of the world was interested. There are a couple of hints that this was taking place. Jesus went to places like uh, Tyre and Sidon. There's a lot of people from Tyre and Sidon. He would go up into that territory more. They started coming to see him all the time. And these are Greek cultures. These are cities that are predominantly non-Jewish. And so lots and lots of people want to know, inquiring minds, they, they want to know what's going on, and the only way to find out is to go to Jerusalem yourself. So I would say there's probably more visitors in Jerusalem than they had in decades. All want to know what's his next move. And then the, the, the thing he does is he cleanses the temple and begins teaching the temple, which only draws more of a crowd. And that's, again, there's a, there's a, there's a court outside of the temple called the Court of Gentiles, and it's supposed to be for proselytes. But there were those that were visitors that were able to get near. And we have that issue with Paul and Acts. You know, they accuse him of bringing in somebody into the court that wasn't supposed to be there. Because they had the court of Gentiles, the court of women, and then the court of men, or Israelite men, leading up into the temple. Um, but anyways, he, he's the son of man, and he's being glorified. And it shows the universal salvation is going to be offered to everyone, uh, including these Greeks. So verse 27 says, Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. His prayer in the garden of Lord, not thy will, but thine be done. Sounds very similar here. That wasn't the first time the apostles had heard him pray that. Uh, here he's saying, Lord, you know, save me from this hour. Let the cup pass. Uh, then a voice. This is cool. Verse 28. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So the Father speaks to him as he prays this prayer. Again, we have no reference of him going anywhere else or being anywhere else. So literally, as he sees these Gentiles coming to hear him, he stops and prays this prayer. You know, he's asking God to let, the, let his hour pass. And God speaks from the heavens and tells him, I'm with you and, uh, and I will continue to glorify you. Uh, Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said it, was, it thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him because they couldn't decipher what was said. And Jesus said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And if I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And again, that's another prophecy that will be fulfilled on the cross. Because when they lift him up, the whole world looks. Uh, verse 33, then he said, uh, this he said, signifying by what his death, his, he would die. The people answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever, and how now can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus said to them, A little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. So Jesus uh, says a few things, comes in riding on this colt, uh, and then he's going to uh, take a, a leave, and he's going to get away from the crowd. This is something he frequently did, and uh, so that way they wouldn't try to make him a king, which is what that happened when they were feeding the 5,000. You know, they said, hey, let's make him a king, and Jesus had to disappear from their midst. So I was listening this morning. We've had some difficulties with getting the podcast going for, for my podcast, which are the sermons and the classes that I do. And I was re-listening to the one about Jesus changing his image, and uh, that was just a few weeks ago. And we talked about all these stories where he just kind of disappears from their midst, or he's hidden from them. And a very neat part of the miracles of Jesus that we don't emphasize. But here he says, remember earlier, if, if a, if a uh, seed falls on the ground and it then is watered, or then it, it takes root and sprouts, more seeds will come as a result of it. And he says, I'm just here basically to sow these seeds, and what's coming next is going to be even better. In fact, Jesus will tell his disciples, you're going to do greater things than I have. And that's hard to believe because he's the Messiah. But he's telling them, 
you're going to pick up, you're going to take the baton, and you're going to do some great things when I'm gone. So, uh, again, this is a prophecy of Daniel. He's the son of man, and, uh, and he knows that he's going to be lifted up. So there shouldn't be any question whether or not he knew the cross was coming. In fact, they know by the way he said it, by the way he worded it, of being lifted up. And they say, well, what does that mean? What are you saying? Are you talking about your death? And if you die, how can you be the Messiah? Because we thought the Messiah was supposed to live forever. But again, they're thinking about flesh. They're not thinking about spirit. Any other thoughts from the last few verses? All right. Let's look at verse uh, 37. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe him. That the word of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts, and turn, so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of them. Now, in a minute, this last little section is going to actually deal more with the light which he had just spoken. But let's focus on this prophecy first. The, 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 one of the last prophecies Jesus gives before he goes to the cross is this. There are going to be people who deny me. There are going to be people who are going to refuse to accept me. And the Jews that were present, even though they knew of the miracle of Lazarus, and even though they saw the crowd, they were so blinded that they did not want their power to be removed. Uh, and this happens in any, any area. Sometimes people can have power too long. And when they have a, a position or an authority for a long period of time, they will abuse it. And so here, Jesus is showing the Pharisees didn't want to believe Scripture. They didn't want to accept the Messiah because he didn't fit their mold. If, he, if Jesus had walked in and said, guys, I'm the Messiah you've been looking for. What would you like to me to do first? There might have been a few of them that said, well, if you're the Messiah, you know, take, take the throne back. You know, kick, kick Rome out of Jerusalem. They might have given him some instruction. But because Jesus would not accept their circle, and you know, you wouldn't be accepted either if every time you're around them, you call them snakes, the blind guides, you know, brood of vipers, or the worst, y'all are children of the devil. I mean, you would not, if you were a Pharisee, like what he had to say either. But you take that upon how hard you work politically to stay safe and to keep your family safe, they didn't want a troublemaker. And they didn't want anybody making trouble with the Jews. They didn't want anybody tr making trouble with the Romans. They were trying to squash any rebellion that they possibly could. And it really comes down to they were afraid they were going to lose their power and influence. Because if he's coming to build a new kingdom, then what does that look like for the religious leaders of the Jews? Are they going to be part of the kingdom? Will the position stay the same? Because the prophecies, if they know them, and you know they do, was to bring all nations together. And the Jews did not want that. They did not want it intermingle with the Greeks. They just refused it. So, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, Owen? He could have defeated the Romans if he had chosen to, because if he could call 12 legions of angels at one time, he could call them at another time. And I dare say 12 legions of angels could have given the Romans a pretty good fight. <laughs> yep. Especially when one of them slaughters thousands in one day. Uh, and it is interesting, too, to think about the power that Jesus had at his disposal, and he still didn't use it. It was, it was always within arm's reach, and, and he didn't. He refused to do it. And in fact, Pilate asks him a very interesting question about rebellion. And he addresses this with the authorities. And he will say, if I was coming to fight, my disciples would carry a sword and they would fight. But that's not the kingdom he was coming to establish. It was not a physical one. And this is another reason why we have to be careful, too, as a religious movement, not to become so entrenched in politics from a state mindset. That is what happened with the Catholic Church. Within two to three hundred years of Acts chapter 2, they immediately start thinking about political power. And I can tell you, as much as we love reading the stories of Christendom and, and things that happened in the early few centuries, it's very clear that there became such a, a corrupt group of leaders. There were individuals who intentionally did things to profit their own bank accounts and had no desire to serve um, godly people. There's actually a story, and I've got it marked in my office, 
of a, um, a pope who was making their way through town, and the pope went into labor. They went into a side alley, and the pope gave birth. It was a woman. And how in the world can you, as a religious entity who claims to follow New Testament principles and follow a apostolic succession, say that two-thirds majority, which is how they vote their next pope, you know, the two-thirds majority, so they put, they put a guy up for pope that isn't a guy. It's a girl, and she's pregnant, which means she's not celibate. So imagine the, the controversy, and they tried to squash that as fast as they could, but they had allowed a woman to become pope, and she had gotten pregnant, and they did not know until she delivered in an alley. And that's, tr that's a true story. And so there's a lot of times with... Especially with religion, if it becomes so entrenched in politics, that's why Rome fell, ultimately. was because It took a while for the East and West to fall, but that's one of the reasons why Rome initially, uh, basically fell, was because uh, after Constantine, they had embraced Christianity to the point that it became a political power. And it is now no... We talk about the Catholic Church. It's the Roman Catholic Church. It's intended to be uh, a, a power, a world power, uh, because of what they did in, in between the 3rd and the 6th century. By the time Boniface III comes on the scene, they were so entrenched in politics, the church basically took over. Yeah. Political power goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. Yeah. I mean, that's where it started, right? Yep. From the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So you would assume that these guys, they're not ready for the kind of side that Jesus is. Yeah. <clears throat> not true. Politicize this thing, but an example of human nature is what's going on currently with the Democrats that refuse to recognize what's going on on the southern border. Yeah. I mean, it's there, they see it, it's reported daily, and they will not recognize it yeah. or acknowledge it. Yep. And, and that's just human nature, you know. I don't care, you know, how good you look, you know, yeah. I'm not going to like you. Yeah. And the same thing, like, what you were referring to with that Pope, that must have been one ugly gal. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how, do you, how do you do that? She must have been covered all the time. Yeah. It's a good point. Yeah. Owen? Man has always accepted what the foolish plan and rejected. <laughs> right. And it doesn't matter whether it's current politics or yeah. back with the Romans. Mm -hmm. yeah. If it's not what I want, I'm not going to do it. It's the right. normal outlook. Yeah. And you don't do it to please the people. You do it to please God. And they were not pleasing God. They were taking and, and doing things that please themselves. And that, that happens even in religious movements. We were talking about this yesterday um, when Eric baptized John Kerry is that the Methodist Church went through the largest split just recently of any denomination in recent history, like in the modern age. And the reason they split was because their desire to embrace homosexuality and to embrace women as pastors. And that, that started, the women pastor thing started 30, 40 years ago. But then when you have the LGBTQ thing, the, some of those within that fellowship said, we just can't do it anymore. And you know how many, you know how many pastors who stood up, lost their, their retirement like that. They were a part of a denomination that they were, the churches were sending money so that they might have retirement. And those churches, those, those, those pastors who stood up and said, we're not going to accept it, they lost their retirement that day. They're, they are not allowed to have access to any of the things that the denomination was providing them once they made that schism. And so it's really hard to live in a, a, in a world where there's so much cultural change and then churches are adapting to do it we're seeing this even in our own fellowship there are there are preachers in our own fellowship i know one that uh has talked publicly about he and his wife's best friends and it's a lesbian couple and they go out to eat all the time and they're like look we love you we don't really like what you're doing in your life but it's no different than going to dinner with an alcoholic or going to dinner with a liar you know so they just continue to bring these ladies to church and uh, and, and influence other people and say, we, 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 you know, we don't really agree with the way that they're living, but we, we certainly aren't going to condemn it. And you're just sitting here going, what, what kind of world do we live in? And we're accepting everything the culture says. Um, 
We, we, I am shocked daily. I mean, we shouldn't be. We should be unshockable and unshakable. But I'm shocked daily at changes that take place that I would have never thought in my lifetime we'd ever see. Yeah, Ellen? I think that the early church had accepted enough of the culture around it that it was not pleasing to God for at least 100 years. Yep. I doubt seriously by 200 AD. Right. If they would have really appeared the same as the church that Jesus established. That's right. And the hard part is, too, a lot of the history we have from the 1st, 2nd, 3rd century are from who we call the uh, early church fathers. And so we have uh, a non-inspired uh, source. I say that very carefully because some of the guys that had followed the apostles at the end of the 1st century and start of the 2nd century had miraculous gifts, but not all. So you're depending upon men without... Holy Spirit inspiration who have told or chosen to tell certain parts of history. So there have to be some things that are, are messed up. I mean, they, they will teach that Peter was the first pope. Well, he didn't even meet the qualifications of what they see as a pope. And there's no way, we don't find anywhere in the first two centuries of any succession, they call it apostolic succession, of anyone other than someone who says, well, I'll help John write a letter or I'll help Paul write a letter. Those guys, that's as close as you get to someone who is arm's length from, a, from an apostle and without an inspiration from the Holy Spirit doing something good. So after the Holy Spirit stops working miraculously and they begin to fulfill uh, the, the Great Commission and go into the whole world and they're doing that by the power of God and not by the power of themselves in their hands, uh, there would have been an influence of if the last guy who used to preach said God spoke to him, then I can also say that God spoke to me. I mean, we still, there are people who honestly believe that Constantine's vision was really from God. That God gave him a vision in the sky. He sees this cross and this, the voice says to him, in this image, you will conquer. And so he puts crosses on all his stuff and he wins. And they all say, oh yeah, Constantine, he's, you know, he's, he is, he's a Christian now and he's, we believe it. We believe that he spoke to God and that he received visions and all these miracles come as a result of it. And we know that the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit had died out by then. But we just believe that ultimately Constantine was right. And he, he was receiving visions from God. And, uh, and so that's part of history. Is That's where the early, uh, by the third century anyway, some of the changes that take place. Because Constantine comes in. And, and he actually, by the way, you can blame his mom for this is that they started saying, how can we prove to people that we have miraculous power and, and wisdom? And his mom comes up with an idea. And she says, let's go find relics. Let's go find relics. So his mom walks around in these holy cities and goes, yep, that's the tomb where he was buried. Walks a little further. Yep, that's the place where he prayed in the garden. Yep, that's where. And in fact, she claimed to have found the cross that Jesus married, born of took to Calvary, and they took that cross, and they made splinters off of it, and sold them. <laughs> they sold them, and, and a statement was made that there were so many splinters of the cross, that if they were all collected, you could build the ark. <laughs> they, they had all these little splinters, people said, big chunks, and you can go to a lot of uh, Jewish, or not Jewish, but Christian uh, museums, and find relics that are not facsimiles, and I was in one in Ohio, I know I probably said this in here, <laughs> there, there's a finger bone for Thomas and a toe bone for Peter, and you're just like, no, no, this little, little Poda church in Fort Recovery, Ohio doesn't have Peter's toe bone. I'm just telling you. So they, they look real. The bones look real. Of course, then they have their little boxes you leave. You can put money in to help their cause. But that's what they did is Constantine's mother came up with this thought. If he's seeing visions from God, I see visions from God, and I'm going to go find everything. I'm going to find out where Mary, you know, lived. I'm going to find out where, and that's how come when you go to the holy cities and you see these markings, those are done by people traditionally. We, we don't know that that's the site, but people like Constantine and his mother in that time were right after the Holy Spirit's, uh, the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit had faded out. They come around and go, well, we are still hearing from God. And God told us this and told us that. So some of our history, early history, after the Bible was written, it, it's, it's certainly slanted in one direction. And so I have to be really careful. When I say something, uh, teach something, I will usually say the early church fathers say. I, it's, not, it's not 
it's not in stone. It's not inspired. Yeah. Owen? At St. Augustine, there were three fountains of youth at one time. So man had to stop doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Three fountains of youth. Yeah, yeah. Well, you remember they, well, and we're, we're bad about jumping. As soon as we hear something, we accept it immediately. Remember a few years ago, they found the island. They thought they did uh, for years, but they finally said that we found the island where Amelia Earhart died. They, they had a place where they said this is where the plane went down. They had a, a portion of planes there that proved that, that she probably had crashed it there. They had witnesses who were listening to ham radios that heard some voice speak of that specific island. They found bones. They found a baby bone. No, I don't know whether she apparently had had a kid with the guy that she crashed the plane with. But, I mean, even Hillary Clinton was out there going, we found the island. We know where she died. Well, have you watched the news this week? <laughs> they, they, they found the plane. <laughs> and it's somewhere between Australia and Hawaii. I mean, it's not anywhere near where they said that she was those years ago. So we get caught up in conspiracy theories all the time. And we still, how many of you... How many of you have ever watched a conspiracy theory video about JFK? Raise your hand. Oh, yeah. Almost everybody in here. We, I mean, you watch it, you're like, man, there's, there's another shooter at the grassy knoll, you know? And then you watch something else, and you go, oh, well, you know this, and oh, well, that. So it's never, there's never been a time in history where people didn't just automatically assume when they hear something that if they trust the source, they believe it's true. But there's certainly a lot of falsehoods about where Jesus was, in certain places, they don't have the manger that he was delivered in. Um, they can pretty much tell what cemetery Jesus may have been buried in, but they don't know the tomb. Uh, and we're talking about thousands of years. And most of the Jews were run out of Jerusalem in AD 70. So who's, who's marking those places? And in fact, if you did mark them, they usually got destroyed. Muslims did that for centuries. If they came into a city, they destroyed the cathedral. They destroyed the well. They destroyed everything. Any artwork, they destroyed it. They even do that to their own artwork. Years ago, many years ago, there were one of the famous things was to sell paintings of Muhammad. Well, somebody came along one day and said, well, you can't have an image of the prophet. So now they cut out his face on all, those, all that artwork so you don't see what his face looked like. And if you ever draw even a cartoon of Muhammad, you're threatened with death. They killed a guy over in, uh, in England for that. You don't, you don't draw Muhammad's face. And so, you know, through history, things get repeated, and we just kind of believe it. But we do need to do our research. We, need to, we can't be so gullible, I guess is a good way to put it. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, you. <laughs> so, you know, to, to show you how corrupt the uh, Roman Catholic Church has been, as an entity as a whole, they're responsible for the most deaths that have occurred since the Roman Catholic Church was created, and they're behind uh, Planned Parenthood, and yeah. it's just so scary. There, one of the one a friend of mine put a post on Facebook today or yesterday and said, "Name five books that you want everybody to read besides the Bible. Five books that you would read. My number one book. There's one chapter you can not pay attention to." But one of the best books I ever read is one is from James D. James Kennedy. Uh, he's a Pentecostal, so the, the book, the chapter on salvation, avoid that one. But most of the book, uh, the contents are so rich. It's called "What If Jesus Had Never Been Born," and he goes through and he diagrams art, music, um, uh, history, keeping of records. He talks about hospitals. He talks about all these things that would never have come into uh, being if it hadn't been for Jesus coming and dying on the cross and his followers doing this stuff. So, yeah, pretty cool. I'll listen to you right now. Uh, going back to what you were describing, them destroying all the images of Muhammad and what yeah. have you, back when the Taliban, before we had gone to war mm -hmm. against them, <clears throat> they were international news because they were destroying these images that were carved into mountainsides right. and what have you of previous I guess you'd say eras right. and uh, instead of keeping them so everybody could see them they were shooting them with 60 millimeter guns and right. destroying them and they were in the news and uh, 
the people that saw that were all up at arms anyway. Right. The Taliban were just uh, people you didn't want to follow. Right. And, and there are, uh, especially with that culture, the Islamic culture, they want to preserve only the history that reveals their own history. They don't want any other history. And that's one of the reasons why during the Crusades, um, there was all this battle back and forth between Islam and Christianity, and the Jews were usually in the middle. Sometimes they aligned, depending on the city, might align with one group or the other. But, uh, but they basically wanted to destroy everything that wasn't Islamic. And, and, and that's sad, too, because even in the Bible, you know, the Bible talks about not tearing down the images and things that you're, you're that have made, the, 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 the cornerstones and the things like that. It's one of the reasons why we think we found the place where Jesus split the rock, or where Moses split the rock, and we think we probably found the ark and things like that. That there are some things that were, that were left intentionally. But um, when it comes to altars, or like Azrath poles, they got to come down. But even when it comes to, like, they, they blew up Hindu uh, temples. They blew up, there was a Buddhist um, statue they blew up. I mean, they just, anything that didn't embrace Islam wasn't a part of the caliphate. That's what they want to do is grow around the whole world, this government. Um, they, they'll destroy it. Yeah, I think, Owen, you were next. In the study of history, they taught us, don't make up your mind what you're going to find and then do your research to prove it. Yeah. But do your research and see what you found. Right. Well, the problem What's the truth? is a lot of religious research is they know what they're going to find before they have a story. Right. And then they just look for any, they discard anything that don't prove their theories. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we talk about how bad it is what they've done over there, but it's happening here. Yeah. Our history. Yeah. The history of the United States has been. Yeah. Right. And I think, uh, you know, we saw that just some years ago with the destruction of flags and certain Confederate uh, monuments that they've been moved or destroyed. And wherever you stand politically, that doesn't matter. Um, there are some things that need to be taught and you need to teach it right. And if you teach it right, you share the good, the bad and the ugly. And, and what we've done is our culture has said we only want one thing. Well, you know what they call that when they have universal education? That's a sign of Marxism, that we're getting to a point where we are, we are only teaching one, one side of history. And when, when you begin to revise history, not only do you cloud the vision of the truth in the past, you're intentionally altering the future so that they only believe one thing. And you will have debates and arguments with people now and they'll just look you straight in the eye and say, this is what they believe. And you're like, that's not true. I mean, they're telling our kids that it wasn't for religious freedom that they came over on the Mayflower. <laughs> you know, they, they came over here because they wanted to be privateers. And they wanted to come over here and, and build businesses and start a start a, a strong and faithful economy and break away from uh, from the tyranny of the king. Well, that's part of that's true. But ultimately, they wanted religious freedom. They were tired of being pushed around by Catholics and uh, Anglicans, the Church of England. They said, we want our own thing. That was our so, number Yeah. Diane? Can you go back to your book list? A book list? Oh, which five? Yeah. <laughs> well, number one would be James D. D. James Kennedy, if, God, if Jesus had ever been born. Um, the second one, anything that, and again, this is my opinion, but anything that Lee Strobel writes, Case for Christ, Case for Christianity, Case for Easter, all those are really good. Lee Strobel. Um, I also put on there, um, what was the other series? I'll have to go look now. I, I, know, I, I know what number four was. Number four was uh, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie. Uh, that was number four. I think that's good, even though it's a kid's book. <laughs> and I put, what's that? We got, we got it. And Fox's Book of Martyrs. John Fox, Fox's Book of Martyrs would be in my top. And there's another series, I can't remember. Oh, D uh, James MacArthur. John MacArthur has a series called 12 Ordinary or 12 Extraordinary. And it's like 12 Ordinary Men, and which is about the apostles. So anything John MacArthur writes, 12 Ordinary or Extraordinary, that, that's my other one. So those are the five. So those are really two series. Because I can't pick a favorite from Lee Strobel. I, I would say probably if, if I could only read one for a year, I'd read for The Case for Christ for a full year straight. But yeah. Another good book, uh, or actually a series of books, is uh, Michael Shank. 
Yeah. Most of those shows. Yeah. Shows yeah. If you've ever read uh, Transformation or Transformed, it's the third one of that series. It's actually written from a, uh, a college or a yeah, it's it's college. It's about Freedom Army. It's, it's a college type. Uh, uh, they're looking to reach <coughs> younger audiences, but he tells his conversion story, and it's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, but you have When Shovels Break, which is the second book that he wrote. Uh, those are all those are all really good. Uh, let's read these last few verses, then we'll go. It says, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and doesn't believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in that last day. For I have not spoken of my own authority, but the Father who sent me to get, gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandments... Uh, commandment is everlasting. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. So his last little thought is, if you're going to reject me, you're going to reject God. If you're not going to listen to my words, you're going to be lost. If you choose not to walk in the light, the only other option is darkness. Which goes back to what he said in the previous story. He came to bring light. Yes, here. Just going back real quick to what you were talking about that scripture you were trying to recall about the yeah, yeah. horses. I think it's uh, Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 17. Yeah, can you read it? Yeah. Uh, when you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you, and possess it and dwell in it, and say, I will set a king over me like the, all the nations that are around me. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses, one from among your brethren, you shall, you shall set as a king over you. You may not set a foreigner on you who is not your brother, but he shall not multiply forces for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply forces. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he break the, uh, multiply silver and gold for himself. Is that it? That's it. Tell me, tell me again, Deuteronomy. Uh, 17, 14 through 17. 14 through 17. Yeah, and yeah that is, that, and, 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 and just to take that prophecy one more level, he says, don't ever have a king that isn't one of your brothers. And there was an Edomite king on the throne. Herod was from the tribe of Esau, not Israel. So that prophecy is fulfilled. So write that down, Deuteronomy. So thank you for that. I knew it was there. I hate to say that sometimes. I'm like, I know there's a Bible verse, but I can't that. But yeah, that's great. Yeah, Lewis, I'll let you have the last word. Okay, well, uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, the corruption of the church in the original design of the church is predicted by Paul mm -hmm. when he says that uh, now the Spirit expressed, set as practice, <laughs> expressly says, but in the latter times, some will depart from the truth, uh, the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, and having their own conscience there with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving or it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Yeah. So, you know, they, Paul had predicted the corruption of yeah. the church and uh, we see the result even today. Yeah, and it's, it's really hard when you read that you start thinking you know, very clearly he's saying stop Stop telling lies. Stop putting people in power that think they're better than other people. You know, don't allow people to tell you you need to be celibate to be a leader of God's people. Uh, don't, don't say that we're going to have lent and fast from certain things. Um, don't, don't, you know, he goes through this whole list of stuff. And it's step by step exactly what the, the Catholic Church began to do. I mean, it's, it's so clear. He's telling Timothy, you need to preach against these things. Endless genealogy. Yeah. 
2 Thessalonians uh, 2, beginning in the third verse, there's a book this guy's going to teach and do. Yeah. If a man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who yeah. opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped. Yep. So that he, as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Well, how far does he miss that? <laughs> Straight up. <laughs> happens exactly like he said. That's right. All right, let's go eat some lunch together. I'll be there in just a little bit. Y'all save me two seats. <laughs> We did it at cost, so there was no. Thank you. Thank y'all for joining us. See you next time. Thank you.